Good evening. Welcome. Welcome to the November 15th edition of the Downers Grove Village Council meeting. We're glad you're with us either here in Chambers or at home on TV. As is our normal process, we will begin the meeting with the Pledge of Allegiance. <coughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Rosa, would you please call the roll? Mayor Barnett? Here. Commissioner Jose? Here. Commissioner Wallace? Here. Commissioner Sadowski Fugit? Here. Commissioner Colavani? Here. Commissioner Gilmartin? Here. Commissioner Glover? Here. Thank you. Is there a motion concerning electronic participation? <coughs> Mayor, I move to allow electronic participation for the November 15th, 2022 Village Council meeting. Second. Comments or questions from council? Rosa, please call the roll. Commissioner Jose? Aye. Commissioner Wallace? Aye. Commissioner Glover? Aye. Commissioner Gilmartin? Aye. Commissioner Colavani? Aye. Mayor Barnett? Aye. Leslie, welcome. Thank you. We'll uh, try and not make you talk too much. Item three on our agenda tonight, we have some proclamations. Uh, there are three of them. And they kind of all go a little bit hand in hand. Uh, November is a month, of course, it has Thanksgiving. And so there are opportunities for folks to reflect a little bit on what they're thankful for uh, and look inward at their own community and look for ways to be helpful to their community. So we have three of them. We'll start with Small Business Saturday. Whereas November 26, 2022, this Sunday after Thanksgiving, is Small Business Saturday, a nationwide campaign to spur business for small merchants and whereas, according to the United States Small Business Administration, there are nearly 32 million small businesses in the United States. They represent 99.7% of all firms with paid employees in the United States. And whereas, from 1995 to 2020, small businesses created 12.7 million jobs, nearly twice as many jobs as large businesses. And small businesses have accounted for 62% of new job creation since 1995. Whereas the Village of Downers Grove celebrates our local small businesses and the contributions they make to our local economy and our community. Whereas the Downers Grove's, Village of Downers Grove supports our local businesses that create jobs, boost our economy, and preserve our neighborhoods. Whereas small businesses are the heartbeat of our community and local economy. Now therefore I, Robert T. Barnett, Mayor of the Village of Downers Grove, do hereby proclaim Saturday, November 26, 2022, as Small Business Saturday in the Village of Downers Grove, and urge all citizens to make a point of choosing to support businesses in Downers Grove now and throughout the year. Dated this 15th day of November, 2022, Downers Grove, Illinois. There are also opportunities during this month. They exist year round, certainly, but we focus a little bit on this, this month to find ways to help others. Whereas the first recognition and awareness event for Hunger and Homelessness Awareness Week was held at Villanova University in 1975. And this past year, more than 700 community groups, faith-based groups, colleges, and high schools across the country came together during the week to raise awareness about the pressing issue of hunger and homelessness. Whereas for nearly 47 years, the National Coalition for the Homeless and National Student Campaign Against Hunger and Homelessness have sponsored National Hunger and Homeless Awareness Week. Whereas the purpose of the proclamation is to bring awareness to the public about the hungry and homeless in our community and encourage support for hunger and homeless assistance service providers. Whereas there are many local organizations committed to sheltering and providing supportive services as well as meals and food and supplies to people experiencing hunger and homelessness, including DuPage Pads, Midwest Shelter for Homeless Veterans, Alex's Mission, Donner's Grove Area Fish, the West Suburban Community Pantry, People's Resource Center, Hope's Front Door, Catholic Charities, and many other faith and community-based service providers. Now, therefore, I, Robert T. Barnett, Mayor of the Village of Downers Grove, do hereby proclaim the week of November 12th through the 20th as Hunger and Homelessness Awareness Week in the Village of Downers Grove, and urge all citizens to look for opportunities to help, volunteer, and support the organizations working to serve our community, and as Thanksgiving approaches, take time to consider opportunities to donate their time, attention, and resources to others. Dated this 15th day of November, 2022, Downers Grove, Illinois. And finally, Giving Tuesday. Whereas Giving Tuesday was established in 2012 as a National Day of Giving on the Tuesday following Thanksgiving. 
Whereas Giving Tuesday is a celebration of philanthropy and volunteerism, when residents across Downers Grove, DuPage County, Illinois, and the country give whatever they can to organizations and causes that are meaningful to them. Whereas Giving Tuesday is a day when citizens work together to share the commitments, rally for impactful organizations, work to build a stronger community, think of others, and give back to their community. Whereas on Giving Tuesday and throughout the year, it is important to recognize the tremendous impact that philanthropy, volunteerism, and community service make to our community and the lives of our residents. Whereas Giving Tuesday is an opportunity to encourage all businesses and residents of Downers Grove to serve others throughout this holiday season and to take this time to dedicate themselves to service throughout the year. Now, therefore, I, Robert T. Barnett, Mayor of the Village of Downers Grove, do hereby proclaim November 29, 2022, as Giving Tuesday Day in the Village of Downers Grove and encourage all citizens to join the giving movement, celebrate together in giving back to the community in ways personally meaningful to them. Dated this 15th day of November, 2022, Downers Grove, Illinois. It's a month of thankfulness, which also means a month of opportunity to look for ways to serve others and your community. Thanks for the time this evening. Item four on our agenda are minutes of previous council meetings. Is there a motion? Mayor, I move that the council adopt the November 1st, 2022 regular minutes and executive session minutes as presented. Second. Any comments from the council on the previous minutes? <clears throat> Rose, would you please call the roll? Commissioner Jose? Aye. Commissioner Wallace? Aye. Commissioner Glover? Aye. Commissioner Gilmartin? Aye. Commissioner Colavaney? Aye. Commissioner sadowski fugit Aye. Mayor Barnett? Aye. That motion passes unanimously. Item five on our agenda, we do have a public hearing this evening. We'll briefly go through the process that we're gonna to use tonight for the public hearing. This public hearing will please come to order. The public hearing has been called by the Village Council to consider the Village budget. Notice of this hearing was published in the Daily Herald on October 27th, 2022, and a certificate of publication is made part of these proceedings. First, Dave Fieldman, Village Manager, will provide an overview of the proposed budget. Then there will be an opportunity for members of the Village Council to ask questions or make comments. Then there will be an opportunity for members of the public to make statements or comments or to submit written statements or comments for the record. Then I will ask for a motion, oh, sorry. After that, I'll ask for if the council wishes to make a statement or a question. And then I'll ask for a motion to adjourn. At this hearing, witnesses will not be sworn and a verbatim written transcript statements or testimony given at the hearing will not be prepared. However, a recording of the procedures will be made on village equipment and retained until minutes of the hearing have been prepared and approved by the village council. So with that, we'll get started. Dave, your presentation, please. Thank you, Mayor Barnett. Uh, tonight's presentation should look very familiar to everybody because it is basically the same presentation we gave on November 1st, the last time the council met, except for a couple changes that were directed by the council at the last meeting, specifically the property tax levy uh, and its impact on the general fund. So here's our budget schedule. Uh, it is a, about a six week process that starts in October when the budget is published and you can see a series of meetings culminating with the planned adoption of the budget and the property tax levy on the December 13th council meeting. We're in meeting number three here tonight uh, and we are holding the budget public hearing. As a reminder that while we do have a lot of information that is published online and in the council's budget binders, that information is provided only in support of the two items that the council actually approves. The first is a budget ordinance, which sets a maximum amount of money that can be spent in each of our funds, and the tax levy ordinances, which are a series of ordinances which establish, as we say, the tax levy that we uh, levy for next calendar year. There are seven key points that we highlight in the budget. I'm gonna start with a little deeper dive on the uh, first two items, a sustainable general fund and no change in the property tax levy. So in the general fund, it has been updated to reflect the direction of the council from our last meeting. The general fund is now budgeted to be sustainable with revenues of 58.38 million and expenses of 57.97 million. The ending fund balance is budgeted to increase by just over $415,000, resulting in a $22.6 million fund balance 
that's right at the uh, recommend or just over the recommended uh, level of annual expenses, or excuse me, of uh, maintaining a reserve of 39% of annual expenses as recommended by bond rating companies. The increase in fund balance is intended to allow the village to reduce the impact to property taxpayers of the FY24 expected required contribution of the public safety pensions. The fund balance will increase by $415,000 in FY23, allowing the village to contribute that amount to the public safety pensions in 24, offsetting the expected increase. This is the flat levy approach that the council spoke of at our last meeting. And so we'll get right to this slide, which shows how the flat levy approach would work. The FY23 property tax levy of 16.89 million is the same as the FY22 <coughs> current year levy. The amount of a typical property pays to the village in property taxes will remain steady at approximately $775. The levy for required contributions to public safety pensions will decrease by $415,000 and the operations levy will increase by that same amount. This flat levy approach is intended to allow the village to reduce the impact uh, to property taxpayers of the uh, drop in uh, the required contribution uh, followed by a significant increase in FY24. So the message here is a flat levy to smooth the impact to taxpayers. Uh, if you're looking at those numbers and you think uh, $775 is a very low tax bill, that is because that is uh, just a portion of the tax bill the village compromises about 10% of the total tax bill with the other taxing bodies comprising the other significant portions. Uh, just to quickly uh, go through the remaining key points of the budget, this budget does provide funding for the Civic Center project, which is now under construction, which will result in a new village hall, a new police station, and shared uh, headquarters for the uh, District 58 administrative functions. It does provide continued investment in our infrastructure systems, investing over $19 million in streets, sidewalks, stormwater, and water systems. The budget does allow funding for the creation of two new full-time positions, a full-time position to help us administer our ERP systems, and a management analyst position in Public Works to help us administer those many capital projects I just spoke of. It also allows for increased funding for vehicle purchases as we catch up on vehicles that we ordered this year that will not be delivered. They will be delivered in 23. That's when the expenses will be incurred so the budget has to reflect that. And of course, there's been an increase in the cost of replacement vehicles across the board. And finally, this budget does provide $940,000 in funding for our valued partners at the Downers Grove Economic Development Corporation and Downtown Management Corporation. That's 540000 to the EDC, 400000 to downtown management, uh, consistent with their requests and very consistent with the historical funding amounts. Uh, we can also provide any additional information the council would like, and we're happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you, Dave. Any comments or questions from the village council? Any comments or qu statements from the public? Okay, one more time. Final questions or comments from the council? Okay, I'll just add for the record, uh, for folks watching at home who may be wondering why a uh, village budget is getting no commentary from the public or the folks up here, uh, this, this is one piece of a process that lasts about half the year. It starts with uh, during late fall with some long range planning, some high priority action item identification for the following year and eventually results in a budget. So much of this has been discussed in pieces over the last four or so months. This is also, as we saw before, our third or fourth budget meeting here, uh, and there'll be more to come. So it, if you have any questions, please do feel free to submit those to the village. You can email us. That's probably the easiest thing to do, uh, and we'll be sure to get those things answered. All right, is there a motion to adjourn this hearing? Mayor, I move to adjourn the public hearing. Second. Rose, would you please call the roll? Commissioner Jose? Aye. Commissioner Wallace? Aye. Commissioner Glover? Aye. Commissioner Gilmartin? Aye. Commissioner Colovaney? Aye. Commissioner Sadowski-Fugit? 
Aye. Mayor Burnett. Aye. That, meeting, that hearing is adjourned. Item six is our consent agenda. Is there a motion concerning a consent agenda? Mayor, I move that the council adopt the consent agenda as presented. Second. Rosa, would you please call the roll? Commissioner Jose? Aye. Commissioner Wallace? Aye. Commissioner Glover? Aye. Commissioner Gomartin? Aye. Commissioner Colavani? Aye. Commissioner Sadowski Fugit? Aye. Mayor Barnett? Aye. That passes unanimously. Before we move on to the first reading portion of our meeting, which is up next on our agenda tonight, uh, I want to take a minute to talk about public comments at our meetings. We've had a few meetings in the past where we lost sight of some basic decorum and mutual respect, and we're counting on everyone here to not let that happen again tonight. Public comment portions of our agenda are important valued parts of every council meeting. There are provisions in the agenda for such input at each active or first reading agenda item as well as later on items not specific to an active or first reading agenda under the subject public comments. Beyond tonight's meeting, there are a variety of additional opportunities to engage your village council members, including our e-remarks system, the CRC system, coffee with the council meeting opportunities, direct email or by phone, and every one of your council members spends time in person off this dais making themselves available to residents and businesses across the community. In fact, those one-on-one -on -one conversations are often the most valuable. The comment opportunities tonight are intentional parts of a structured meeting. They offer an opportunity to deliver comments to the council. Please remember they are not a debate, nor is an open question and answer session. Whether it be for something said from the dais or a comment delivered from the council, let's not have any applause and let's not have any heckling. The fact of the matter is your council is listening, taking notes, considering what is said. Often and rightly, some time is needed to reflect on the comments presented. That same consideration is expected of everyone in the room. Applause or heckling just diminishes the effect of the comments and diminishes everyone's ability to consider them. If you do plan to speak, please keep the following in mind. Please state your name for the record, address your comments to me as the chair of the meeting, Keep comments to five minutes or less. Avoid repeating what others have already said. Keep your comments to one visit to the podium per subject. And please remember that comments are most effective when they focus on subjects within the scope of Downers Grove Village Governance. Finally, if you forget to mention something or additional conversation brings up a new idea, don't keep it to yourself, but do hold it until after the meeting. Use one of the other contact methods, email, CRC, or the phone or contact us as needed, bring that new comment to our next meeting. We do not have an active agenda tonight, so we'll move on to the first reading portion of our meeting. This is where we plan to discuss items, in some cases for the second time and others for the first, but nonetheless items on which we do not plan to take formal action tonight. With that, it's over to you, Dave. Three items on tonight's first reading agenda, and in fact, the first two we're talking about for the second time tonight, because they were already Presented. The first item is an ordinance adopting the fiscal year 2023 budget in lieu of passage of an appropriation ordinance. This is a standing item on our first reading agenda until the budget is ready for approval in mid-December. We just presented it, but we have no further presentation. We'll pause to see if the council has any questions or comments on the budget. Thank you, Dave. Any comments from the council? Any comments or questions from the audience? A little weird to be doing this a second time around, but it's, it's part of the process to make sure that everybody gets a chance. Okay, move on, Dave. And we'll do it again on item B, which is a motion to estimate the 2022 aggregate tax levy for the village of Downers Grove. This is a step that is required by state law. Uh, we do not have any further presentation. It's the same information you just saw. Uh, if you look at the uh, agenda materials that are online for tonight's meeting, you will see what I'll call the gross levy amounts. Those are the levy amounts before any abatements. But you will also see the net levy amounts, which is after any abatements. And you will see that that net levy amount is the same 16.89 million levy that we've discussed before tonight and at the previous council meeting and at last week's uh, coffee with the council. Uh, so with that, we have no further <coughs> presentation of, and of course, stand ready to answer any questions the council may have. Thank you, Dave. Relative to the levy, any questions or comments from the council? Questions or comments from the audience on the tax levy, the estimate of the levy. I'll just add before we move on to the next subject here, um, if you're watching at home or you want to follow this a little bit more, a couple of things. First of all, on our website, on the right-hand column near the top, just below trending topics, there is a link to village budget. 
Um, all of the documents that we've been considering for some time are there. Uh, please take some time to go through that if you're interested in your village's budget. Additionally, the, meeting, um, the meetings we've had to this point are, are maintained on our YouTube channel, and I would recommend going back and watching those, in particular the meeting, uh, the last, meet, last village council meeting prior to this one. There was some, a little bit of additional discussion, in particular as it relate, relates to some of the changes that you saw presented tonight. Uh, the flat tax levy itself was part of that conversation, so I'd recommend going there and checking out that, that meeting as well. All right, Dave, you got a third item? We do. This is an ordinance amending traffic control provisions at various intersections. Uh, these are items that have come out of our Transportation and Parking Commission, and here to present information on this item is our Public Works Director, Andy Sickich. Thank you, Dave. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Tonight I'll be presenting, as Dave just said, various proposed traffic control revisions. Um, these include recommendations from the Transportation and Parking Commission, as well as some village manager uh, approvals that are authorized under Section 14.4 of the Village Code. First area we're going to look at includes traffic control uh, recommended by the TAP Commission at the intersections of Randall Street and Washington Street and at Randall Street and Lyman Avenue. So traffic calming petition was received regarding Randall Street at Washington Street which then resulted in additional staff analysis at the adjacent intersection at Randall and Lyman. The uh, concern at both of these intersections is related to the right of way between motorists and pedestrians, especially due to the amount of children and pedestrians that use the crossings to access neighborhood schools and parks. The neighborhood was previously studied in neighborhood traffic study one way back in 2011. So the intersection of Randall Street and Washington is currently two-way stop controlled on Randall. Washington Street is not required to yield or stop. There's also a school crosswalk at the north leg of this intersection. The intersection of Randall and Lyman is currently two-way stop controlled on Randall. Lyman is not required to yield or stop. Staff reviewed the current operations, traffic data, and crash reports for this area. And since the time of the neighborhood traffic study, there does appear to have been an increase in pedestrian activity um, and traffic patterns have also changed due to some turn restrictions on 55th Street. Um, these were at the intersections of Webster and Washington. So traffic volumes have also increased on Randall Street and Lyman Avenue, and they've decreased on Washington from the time of that neighborhood study. The proposed change uh, to intersection control to all-way stops for both of these intersections is consistent with the goals of the village for positive driver feedback and for improved operations for all users. This change would address the confusion regarding right-of-way for the typical user of the crossings, which includes a high percentage <coughs> of children utilizing the designated school crossing on Washington and traveling to the schools and parks. So staff is recommending a change to an all-way stop at both of these intersections. The next locations include Lincoln Street, at both Washington and Highland, and Highland Avenue at Chicago. Again, a traffic calming petition was received regarding Lincoln Street at Washington Street, and we also received additional resident inquiries um, regarding Lincoln Street at Highland and Highland at Chicago. And these are all a block apart, so we, we analyzed them all kind of together. The concern at all of these locations, again, is confusion as, as to the right of way between vehicles and vehicles and between vehicles and pedestrians, especially, again, due to the amount of children and pedestrians that are using these crossings to act, access schools. This neighborhood was previously studied in Neighborhood Traffic Study 4, which was in 2015. So we'll start with the intersection at Lincoln Street in Washington. It's currently two-way stop controlled on Lincoln, and Washington is not required to yield or stop. There is a signed pedestrian crossing on the north leg of this intersection. The, vol the volume at Washington Street is about 2,000 cars a day, and there are uh, significant numbers of children and pedestrians that att uh, attempt to cross at this location to access Downers Grove North and Herrick Middle School. The intersection of Lincoln and Highland is currently two-way stop controlled on Lincoln. Highland is not required to yield or stop, and there are sight distance concerns at this intersection due to some mature trees that limit the visibility for the east-west through vehicles. The concentration of children crossing at this intersection is even higher than it is at Lincoln and Washington due to its proximity to the schools. And there have been two crashes in the last five years at this intersection that were attributed to confusion relating to the right-of-way. 
And finally, the intersection of Highland and Chicago is currently two-way stop controlled on Highland. Chicago is not required to yield or stop. The traffic volumes uh, at this intersection are fairly well balanced between these two streets, which contributes to additional driver confusion as to who is supposed to stop. Um, there have been 10 crashes in the last five years at this intersection, attributable again to confusion of right of way. So again, staff reviewed the current operations, traffic data, and crashes for this area. And since the time of the neighborhood study, just like in the last area we looked at, um, there also appears to have been an increase in pedestrian activity, which is pretty consistent throughout the area. The number of crashes that occurred at the intersection of Highland and Chicago is quite a bit higher also than the other intersections that we studied for, the, for this report. Uh, the proposed change, again, is to always stop through these intersections to improve driver feedback and improved uh, operations for all users, which include pedestrians. So staff is recommending a change to an all-way stop at all three of these intersections. Finally, the ordinance also includes several items that were handled by a temporary village manager's approval in accordance with section 14.4 of the village code. They include an all-way stop at the intersection of Burlington and Mokel, and several locations where existing yield signs were converted to stop signs, which has been our practice in recent years. And with that, I'll open it up to any questions. Thank you, Andy. Any comments or questions from the Village Council? Comments or questions from the audience? Okay, well, Andy, before you leave, I'll just add, um, just for folks watching at home really as much as anything this is a pretty normal thing that happens over time um, pedestrian patterns change vehicle patterns change vegetation changes um, and so we are kind of regularly monitoring things like crash frequency and input from residents and and making adjustments to things but as much as we do it is still tough out there with the amount of traffic and pedestrians we have so um, it's something that if you've been watching our meetings, it's come up over and over and over again. It will continue to come up over and over and over again. We have a very robust and vital town, which is great, um, with a lot of people in it. So the, the thing I wanted to mention to everybody is when you get frustrated about traffic um, or you get frustrated as a pedestrian, just remember this is us, really. I, I don't know how else to say it, but we always kind of sort of assume it's the other guy, and it's probably not. So slow down. Keep an eye out for pedestrians. It's an important part of, of frankly, being in one community together. So, thanks, Andy. You're welcome. And that ends our first reading, but that won't stop the presentations from Mr. Sickich to keep coming along. So if you don't mind, Mayor, I'll go right into the manager's report and allow Andy to present information on lead service line replacements. Glad you didn't let him get away. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dave. Um, okay, so as Dave said, tonight's report is a follow-up to our previous discussion on the Lead Service Replacement and Notification Act. This was originally discussed back at the Village Council meeting on August 2nd as part of our long-range plan update. So I'd like to start off by defining which part of the village's water system this act pertains to. You'll see here uh, a graphic that should be pretty familiar to you by now. It depicts a typical water service. So the water main, which is typically out near the street, is owned and maintained by the village. Um, these are not made of lead. These are generally made of an iron pipe. Uh, the service line that runs from the water main to each individual home is what this act applies to. And the public portion in this graphic is shown in red, and it runs between the water main and the shutoff valve, which is usually behind the curb or the sidewalk. Uh, and then the private portion here is shown in green, and that runs between the shutoff valve and the home. And this act pertains to the entire service from the water main all the way into the home, both the public and the private portions. The Lead Service Replacement and Notification Act, which I'm for now just going to call the act, was enacted by the state of Illinois and became effective January 1st, 2022. This law primarily requires the village to develop and maintain a complete inventory of lead service lines by 2024 and it requires us to implement a plan to replace all lead service lines between 2027 and 2044. We also have to use good faith efforts to contract with vendors owned by minority persons, women, and persons with a disability to complete the work. Lead service lines must be completed, or replaced, sorry, when either the public or private section is damaged, a property owner initiates a service line replacement, 
or the adjacent water main is replaced. And in all of these cases, the both sections must be replaced unless the property owner signs a waiver opting out of the private portion. The village has the option to charge the property owner for the cost of replacing the private section of a lead service line unless we are using federal or state funds for the lead service line replacement. Staff estimates that there are about 1,500 to 3,000 existing lead service lines in the village. And we believe all of them generally are located in the central portion of the village. The lead service line inventory that will be prepared in 2024 will confirm the actual number of lead services. Staff estimates the annual cost of complying with this act will be about $200,000 in each of the years 2023 through 2026 and about $2 million per year from 2027 through 2024. So this is a hard slide to, to read, I understand. Um, based on the council's discussion in July, staff is proposing that the responsibility for the replacement of the private side of the water service be handled as summarized in this table. And there are three basic scenarios that I'll walk through one by one. In the event of a service replacement that's required by new construction, such as an addition or a new home, the property owner is responsible for the entire new service from the water main to the house. In the case of a property owner initiated replacement that's not required by a construction um, or which is due to a leak on the private side of the service, the property owner would be responsible for the private side of the service and the village will replace the public side of the service. And the, the third case, uh, in the case of a village initiated replacement, which would be uh, a new water main project or a leak on the public side of the service or a service replacement that's required by this act. The village will be responsible and pay for both the public and private side of the service. And of course, in this case, the property owner, again, they can opt out of the private side of the service being replaced if they sign a, wa a waiver and they install a filter that's supplied by the village. Um, it should be noted that no changes to the village code are required to implement these uh, practices. But that being said, the state has not published the rules and regulations for administering the act. So any additional information or potential modifications that might be required to the village code as a result of the final rules and regulations uh, would be brought forth for the village council consideration at a later date. And with that, I will open it up to any questions. Thanks, Andy. Any council comments or questions on the act? Chris. Yeah, I was just curious of the Folks who may have the lead line, the 1,500 to 3,000, is that something that they can contact the village to determine or understand if they have, in fact, lead lines? Um, yeah, we can, we can help determine that if somebody's interested. Okay. Okay, thank you. Right. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I uh, just wanted to say I'm in support of the, uh, the plan as laid out. Uh, I think this is the the, the right way for the village to go about the responsibility of paying for the private side of the service and obviously we have to pay for the public side of the service so um, i think it makes sense thank you that's rich do we have any uh visibility into possible funding either from the federal government or the state on this issue if um if we're not charging individual owners yeah, we are anticipating that there will be significant funding available at the state and federal level as this progresses. Uh, like Andy said earlier, the rules aren't out and we don't know the details of that funding, but it is our hope that there will be funding available for some of those major expenses that start in a couple years. Um, but until then, we'll just follow the, use our own funds and follow the rules that Andy talked about, about you know, uh, making sure that we're following if we have uh, state funding already in place, then we won't charge for it. Uh, but since that's not the case right now, this is the point. Anyone else? Andy, do you think the uh, additional rules about administering the act will speak to or direct us with any kind of prioritization? Or will that still be likely in our hands? It's a crystal ball kind of question. Yeah, I really don't know. It's it's kind of up in the air right now as to what those rules and regs are going to say. That seems to me like one of the questions we're going to be faced with. If it's not told to us, certainly as we get to 26-ish, we're going to have to determine how we're going at that. Um, Rich, this is totally unofficial, but when this 
first came out, I spent some time with uh, both our federal and state legislators discussing that subject, and there likely will be quite a bit of funds available. The challenge is it's likely not enough, and so there will, you know, I shouldn't say there will because we don't know yet, but the likelihood of there being some sort of a need component is high, which may work uh, kind of against us a little bit. So we have to prepare to do the work that's required. And that's based on the municipal need. Right. Right. Under underserved, under resourced areas. Correct. Yep. So this is really setting up for a pretty uh, likely robust discussion in the 2025 time frame in our long range planning efforts, where we'll know more of this and sort of long range plan to deal with 27 to 44. Right. Any questions or comments from the audience on the act? Lead Pipe Act. Okay, seeing none, we'll move on. Thank you, Andy. Thank you. I have one other question or comment. Go ahead, Rich. We, have we had any other experience where we've uh, paid for stuff on private property that was not owned by the village? Uh, not to our knowledge of the top of our head, but Ann and I and Andy can take a look. Um, yeah, we didn't pay. No, we've, we had a, a scenario years ago, but it wasn't paid by the village. But we've also had circumstances where we've given no interest loans for, like, for instance, water main uh, improvements, water service improvements. We, we the village, have paid for uh, water main extensions into recently annexed neighborhoods or areas missing uh, village infrastructure uh, out of the general water fund resources. Okay. Okay, there'll be a lot more to come on this. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Uh, before we wrap up the manager's report, uh, we'll continue with our series of updates on our Civic Center project. Um, Deputy Manager Mike Baker is the project manager and he'll have an update for us. Mike. Thank you, Dave. Uh, construction work continues on the Civic Center project. You can see a rendering here of the building in site that when, when completed will house the village hall functions, the police station, and our partners at District 58 with their administrative offices. Um, the project remains on schedule and under budget at this point and some of the most recent construction work has included the uh, beginning of the foundations and footings being installed and the video I'm going to show you now does a much better job than I can describe that work so here it is work that's been completed in the past week. as always to our great staff in the communications awesome. department for putting that together. Be happy to answer any questions. Any questions? I had one that you answered. I was going to ask if we we're uh, capturing time-lapse photography of the project. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we are. The other point I'd like to make is 50 years from now this will be historic, so hopefully we're doing a great job archiving that. Absolutely. And if we place a cornerstone or time capsule we need to mark where it is. <laughs> that is the manager's report tonight, Mayor. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Rich. <clears throat> Attorney's report. Yes, I have a very boring, boring report. Two items only to present. An ordinance adopting the fiscal 2023 budget and an ordinance uh, revising traffic control provisions in various locations throughout the village. That's all, Mayor. Thank you, Enzo. Item 11 on our agenda is public comments. This is an opportunity for the public to comment on non-agenda items. 
Um, just as a reminder, that conversation earlier, please uh, be kind to one another. So if you've got some comment you'd like to give us, please come on down to the podium. No? Okay. All right, we will move on to the mayor's report. We have a brief report tonight. It's a, uh, there's a resolution appointing some members to boards and commissions. Rosa, could you read that resolution? A resolution appointing and reappointing members to village boards and commissions, whereas pursuant to section 2.53 of the Downers Grove Municipal Code, the village council of the village of Downers Grove has made the following appointment to village boards and commissions. Now therefore be it resolved that the village council of the village of Downers Grove does hereby confirm the following appointment. Library Board of Trustees appoint Marty Sladak to a one-year term expiring August 31st, 2023. That is all, Mayor. Thank you, Rosa. Somebody like to move that resolution? Mayor, I move that the council adopt the resolution as presented. Second. Comments or questions from the council? Okay, I'll just add um, uh, once again, thank you to everybody that wants to serve and tries to serve and offers to serve our community. I think we had, in this instance, about 40-some folks who were willing to volunteer their services to the library board. Your council narrowed it down to three people, um, which we interviewed, and, and it, was, uh, it was heartwarming to see three really qualified people want to serve their community. It was great. Um, at the end of the day, we had picked one, not three, and so that's what we're doing here tonight. Uh, thank you all to everybody that applied, and, and thank you to those who continue to serve. Rose, would you call the roll? Commissioner Jose? Aye. Commissioner Wallace? Aye. Commissioner Glover? Aye. Commissioner Gilmartin? Aye. Commissioner Colovaney? Nay. Commissioner Sadowski Fugit? Aye. Mayor Barnett? Aye. That motion passes six to one. Item 13 on our agenda are council member reports. It's an opportunity for council members to report out on other goings on in the community they're connected to or familiar with or other groups they're working with. Leslie, do you want to say anything or would you like to just avoid that? Sure, I'll just say something real quick. Um, so I just want to wish everyone a, a joyful Thanksgiving and hope to see many of you at the Grove Express. Please try to do your shopping at local businesses. We're blessed to have engaged and charitable business owners in Downers Grove, so give them some love. Finally, you can hear my slightly off-floating voice because I finally came down with my first case of COVID that I know of, likely while working on election day. Um, I'm up to date on my vaccinations. I'm young in my 30s, healthy, exercise regularly, and have no risk factors. <clears throat> and I'm lucky enough to have gotten past COVID on the first day I tested positive. But the following day after, I felt touch and go with shortness of breath and was actually worried. Luckily, the Paxlovid kicked in, and now I'm doing really well, and I'm on the bend, and I'm just a couple of days of escaping quarantine while masked. Um, but it's just a simple reminder that COVID is still here, and you never know who's going to get a little bit scary of a case. So just try and make sure you're up to date on your vaccinations. And don't forget, we're now lucky enough to have several treatments available. But more importantly, just try to be safe, be kind, and give people grace if they're still masking this holiday season. And that's it. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. We're all wishing you well. Get soon. Get well quick. Danny. No report. Thank you, Mayor. Chris. No, I'm just happy Thanksgiving to all of our residents. Greg. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Stay safe and healthy. Rich. Uh, happy Thanksgiving as well. Nicole. Speaking of Thanksgiving, the Grove Express 5K Downers Grove's annual Thanksgiving Day race is next Thursday, November 24th at 8.30 in the morning. You can still register at groveexpress.com. Wishing everyone a wonderful Thanksgiving. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Is there a motion to adjourn? Mayor, I move to adjourn. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. We are adjourned. Thank you all and good night.